an honor to chair this first session. And um, it's even a bigger honor to introduce Rose King. And um, he um, seems to be a, an expert on something that makes me a bit worried, the automation of science. I hope I will not lose, soon lose my job, but I'll um, not lose more words on that and just leave him the stage. So Ross is from, I should maybe say, Chalmers University of Technology and will open the conference with his presentation. Okay, uh, uh, this, great. Uh, it's, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak. Uh, as I say, it, as people said, it, it's an honor to speak at this such a meeting, and I'm uh, excited to hear the other talks. So I'm going to talk about uh, the automation of scientific research. So the traditional name given to the application of AI to science is scientific discovery. And uh, AI systems, uh, I'd argue, have uh, where they have superhuman powers. You know, uh, they can flawlessly remember vast numbers of facts, uh, unlike human beings. They can do flawless logical reasoning, un unlike human beings. They can do near optimal probabilistic reasoning, uh, unlike humans. They can learn from vast amounts of data which no human could ever encompass. You know, they can. Uh, deal with gigabytes, terabytes, vast amounts of data. And it can also extract information from uh, millions of scientific papers, which no human being would ever have time to read. So already uh, machines have superhuman powers, which uh, complement that of human scientists. And uh, I'd also argue that science is uh, a nice application area for AI. Uh, Scientific problems are abstract, uh, like the games Go and Chess, where uh, computers have excelled at. But of course, there is this uh, a much more interesting science because it involves the real world. And scientific problems are restricted in scope. And that really simplifies uh, the uh, the inference methods for the for the AI systems. So the uh, there's no need for an AI system to understand. Uh, about vegetables, about politics, if to do an area, to do some work on a particular area of science. So the quote is uh, from uh, Alison Wonderland, talk of cabbages and kings and many things. So AI systems don't need to know about cabbages and kings, they just need to know about the particular area of science. And another advantage is that uh, nature is honest. By this I mean that if a uh, human scientist or an AI scientist has done some experiment, uh, we're fairly confident that the real world uh, will tell the truth about how it works. You know, it's, uh, we may misinterpret the meaning of the experiment, but we're fairly confident the real world isn't trying to hide this mechanism from us. Uh, and this honesty is quite different from, say, uh, applying AI to, to the stock market or some military games or something. Uh, it makes it much easier to do the inferences if nature, as nature is honest. And I'd also argue that nature is a worthy object of our study. So uh, many of the brightest minds on the planet are uh, working in machine learning and AI. But what they're doing is uh, making more addictive advertising for large corporations. You know, they, and they're doing that because that's, they get paid the best to do that. Uh, but if I'm uh, in some years time, if I look back at my career, I don't want to look back and say, I managed to make a lot of money by just selling things to people that don't really want. I would like to try to uh, make some contribution because the world's faced with uh, all sorts of problems. You know, we have, uh, we have a, we're in the midst of a pandemic, we have uh, global warming, there's food insecurity for, for a large percentage of the population. There's still many horrible diseases out there. And I hope that AI could actually contribute to, to solving these problems and that the generation of scientific knowledge is a public good, at least if that knowledge is in the public domain. So the idea of applying AI to science is not new. It goes back to the 1960s and 70s in Stanford, in the dendral and metadendral projects. So, so metadendral is arguably one of the first ever machine learning 
uh, programs, and it was to do with analysis of mass spec data. Uh, the motivation for doing this was the Viking uh, probes to Mars. Uh, Mars is very far away, and even at the speed of light, it takes uh, many minutes to send uh, information to Mars and get it back. So it's hard to control things on Mars. So the idea was we would have uh, automated scientific experimentation on Mars. Unfortunately, uh, didn't quite have the uh, computational uh, hardware and software back then to actually achieve this. But the project was a landmark. Uh, it was led by Joshua Lettenberg, who got Nobel Prize for, for medicine uh, for his work on bacterial gen genomics. Uh, but he also actually uh, led the project. It was his idea. He taught himself computer science. He was very interested in actual formalization of science and, and logic. Uh, Ed Fagerman was the main computer scientist on the project. He, uh, he got the Turing Award for his work on expert systems. The Turing Award is the Nobel Prize equivalent for computer science. Uh, Bruce Buchanan uh, was one of the founders of machine learning. And Carl Gerasi, uh, in my view, should have got the Nobel Prize for his uh, work on chemistry. Uh, he was one of the co-inventors of the birth control to uh, transform the world. Another uh, landmark uh, in scientific discovery was the work of Bacon. Uh, this project was led by Herbert Simon, who got the Nobel Prize for his work on economics. He also got the Turing Award uh, for his work on AI. So the only person so far to have gotten Nobel Prize and Turing Award. It, the, the Bacon program itself was a bit controversial. It uh, claimed to rediscover a number of uh, uh, physical laws like Kepler's laws. Uh, what was controversial was that they gave the system quite cleaned up data. It was quite different from uh, the problem that actually Kepler had to face. Uh, but still, it was a, a major contribution. And uh, the first person to ever take an AI system into the, the lab was Jan Zipkov, uh, who died actually almost 20 years ago. So my contribution is working on robot scientists. So, so what's a robot scientist? So the idea is to build a computer a robotic system, which kind of sends to simple forms of scientific research. So the robot scientist has uh, background knowledge about an area of science. This knowledge is represented using uh, logic and probability theory, because these are the two best ways we know how to represent knowledge. The robot scientist has an uh, automated way of forming novel hypotheses about that area of science, essentially using different types of machine learning to do that. The robot scientist also has an automated way of deciding on efficient experiments. So these ex experiments are efficient in terms of time and money. And these are also selected using different forms of machine learning. The robot scientist then has a, will program a lab automation system to actually physically execute the experiments and interpret the results and analyze them and uh, make the hypotheses more or less probable based on the results of the experiment. So the, this was then, the cycle was then repeated and repeated until there is only one theory consistent with the background knowledge and experimental results, or it runs out to some uh, resource. So that's the basic idea. We want to build uh, an autonomous system which can do sort of simple forms of scientific research. And uh, the original motivation for this was uh, philosophical. I'm interested in the philosophy of science. And it seemed to me that if we could actually build a machine that did scientific research, then it would teach us something about what science actually is. So it's a, an operational approach to the philosophy of science. The idea is if you want to understand some phenomena, then you make a machine to reproduce it. And uh, I'm able to read this. This was Richard Feynman's blackboard at the time of his death. What it says there is, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So it has this same operational approach to, to understanding things. You know, if you want to understand uh, human intelligence, try to build a machine which is intelligent. That will inform you about what intelligence is. Uh, I also recently found out this quotation from a uh, less well-known uh, uh, scientist or philosopher of science, Winston Churchill. Uh, he pointed out uh, that uh, 
a long time ago that it's possible to potentially to build some machine which did scientific research. And I don't think our present prime, prime minister in Britain is uh, in the same uh, league of uh, insight into the philosophy of science. The other motivation is uh, technological. Uh, I said earlier that the world is faced with all these problems. And in my view that the only possible way out of these problems is uh, better science and technology. So we need to make uh, scientific research uh, more efficient, you know, and robot scientists can potentially work cheaper, faster, more accurately than and longer than human beings. And they can also be more easily multiplied. You know, it doesn't take 20 years to grow another one. You know, we can make thousands of them if, if they actually work very quickly. Another motivation is that uh, robot science has the potential to improve the quality of uh, science. Uh, in many areas of science, there is uh, problems of reproduci reproducibility. So uh, in, say, for instance, in biomedicine, I, I know well, countless billions of dollars are spent annually on experiments that can't be reproduced in other people's labs. And the reason for this is not that there is scientific uh, fraud or anything like that. It's just that the scientific system, well, the the experimental systems are so delicate that it's very hard to replicate them in, in other places because they're not uh, recording sufficient detail. And robot science has the potential to improve the quality of science by much greater semantic clarity in the, the recording of experiments. And of course, robot scientists are also robust to pandemics. You know. I've worked on this a long time. The initial work uh, demonstrated that that cycle could be uh, fully automated, but it was only using very simple laboratory automation and only rediscovered some known uh, science. The Adam project, uh, which I'll talk about in, in so, a little bit detail, uh, demonstrated that physically, if you get the robotic system to do all the experiments required, and Adam discovered some novel science, Eve took the same idea and applied it to a more important uh, societal problem, uh, drug design for tropical diseases. And I'm currently working on the Genesis system, which I'll describe at the end. So I wanted to, before going on to say a bit about uh, logic, because uh, this is relatively poorly understand, understood by most scientists, I would argue. So there are different, uh, I would argue there are different types of logic. Uh, the traditional logic is uh, deduction. This is uh, this goes back to Aristotle uh, 2,300 years ago. In his writings, he actually claimed to have uh, invented logic or, or discovered it. Uh, logic is the, the basis of uh, mathematics, uh, or deductive logic is the basis of mathematics. You have a set of axioms and deductive inference, and then you infer new theorems from the axioms and inference methods. And computer science, or well, computers are essentially doing deduction when they execute uh, programs. So here's an example of a deduction. Uh, rule all swans are white. You have a fact, Daffy is a swan. Then deductive inference is that Daffy is white. And the beautiful thing about uh, deduction is that if the rule and the fact are true, then you can only infer new truths. So it's truth preserving. Unfortunately, deduction is insufficient to uh, automate science or to do science. You need some other methods of uh, forming uh, new ideas. So one such approach is abduction. Uh, here's an example of that. You have a rule, all swans are white. You have a fact that Daffy is white. Then you can infer abductively that Daffy is a swan. And the thing to note here is that this is not truth preserving. Uh, uh, Daffy is in fact, uh, duck yes but this hypothesis that Daffy is a swan can be uh, experimentally tested so it's a way of generating new ideas and uh, if you read the uh, the stories and novels of about Sherlock Holmes uh, which I recommend actually they're very interesting uh, he in the stories he says I deduced you know that the butler was the the murderer that is actually technically incorrect. He abduced it. Yes. So it's uh, there are other possible explanations, uh, but the particular inference he made, the abduction, is a likely one. That's 
so all detective novels are based around abduction. And uh, yes, uh, this uh, this example of Daffy as a Dockerous one is uh, I tried to use in uh, an article I, I have in uh, Scientific American, but the publishers wouldn't go for it because they said it's you know it's intellectual property of Warner Brothers and we will be breaking copyrights. You know, it's, uh, the other way of forming novel ideas is uh, through induction. Uh, this is the way that's generally assumed to happen in physics. So you have ex examples like Daffy is a swan in white. You have a fact that Tweety is a swan in white. Then you infer inductively that all swans are white. And this is also not truth preserving, this method. Uh, the example that all swans are white actually goes back to Aristotle and it was taught in uh, European universities throughout the Middle Ages. But when explorers got to uh, Australia, they discovered that swans are black there. So induction is, uh, we constantly use it in our daily lives. It's the reason I believe the sun will rise tomorrow, the, the laws of physics will continue, uh, my breakfast won't poison me. All these things are inductive inference. But they have, uh, the reason that we believe them, as the philosopher David Hume pointed out, is that it's worked in the past, which is in itself uh, induction. So that's how to justify induction is one of these big problems in philosophy. It's been argued over for centuries. Okay, so the first robot scientist I built is called Adam. The application area was in functional genomics of yeast. So yeast is the organism uh, which is used to make bread and wine and beer and whiskey. But within biology, it's used as a model for eukaryotic cells. And humans are eukaryotes, so it's used as a model for our cells. And the particular application is in trying to figure out the function of genes. And this yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's uh, arguably the, the best understood of all uh, cellular organisms. But to this day, around about 15% of its genes, we still don't know the function of them. And the technique that was used was to look at these uh, deletant mutants. So the idea is that, say, if you're trying to understand how a car works, you would uh, systematically remove components and see what happened to the car. So if you remove the steering wheel, you discover that you can't uh, steer very well. Therefore, you'd infer that the steering wheel is to do with steering. That's the sort of inference that was used. Uh, To form, we needed to formalize it to, to ensure that it's going to be automated. We used logic programming to represent background knowledge. Logic programming is uh, essentially using first order predicate logic as a programming language. It has uh, a number of uh, beautiful features for the computer scientist like, but it's also uh, nice and explicit. And we focused on metabolism and we modeled metabolism as a directed label hypergraph. So that is so like quite a large model involving thousands of components which related what the yeast ate to its uh, cellular components, its amino acids, etc. We used abduction to infer new hypotheses, uh, adoptive logic programming and techniques from bioinformatics. Uh, it turns out that most hypothesis formation in biology is abductive, so you infer some missing component which explains what you observe. We used active learning to decide on efficient experiments, so active learning is the branch of machine learning where the computer gets to choose its next example. And there's a close analogy between active learning and the scientific method. And we use machine learning to decide the meaning of experiments. So one of the things that the philosophy of science doesn't emphasize enough is that experiments aren't necessarily clear in their meaning. You know, philosophers seem to think that when you have an experiment, nature is completely clear about what, what it means, but that is not the case, as any experimental scientist would tell you. So Adam uh, generated and confirmed some novel functional genomic hypotheses. Uh, these are related to the functional genes in these cerevisi. Uh, so Adam hypotheses, hypothesized these functions of the genes and then uh, experimentally confirmed them. We then went to the lab and did gold standard experiments to confirm these hypotheses. Uh, so we argue that Adam was the first machine to autonomously discover novel scientific knowledge both hypothesize and experimentally confirm it. 
wanted to say a bit about formalizing science. Uh, so the goal of science is to increase our knowledge of the natural world through experiments. I argue that knowledge should be expressed in formal logical languages, not in English or German or French or whatever. Uh, these languages, natural languages, are designed for humans to communicate, and uh, they're full of ambiguities and deliberately so. You know, they're there to you know write poetry, make someone fall in love with you, things like that. They're not designed for semantic clarity necessary for science. Uh, so logic is designed to do that. It's designed to express knowledge in a clear and completely explicit way. So I argue that scientific knowledge should be expressed in logic for semantic clarity. So robot scientists are an excellent test bed for developing methodologies to formalize science. Uh, it's possible to capture and curate all aspects of the scientific process. Not uh, So you have a complete uh, pathway from any observations to conclusions. Uh, the reason for the experiment is explicit, everything's explicit. So we develop ontologies to do that. An ontology is a logical uh, formalization, well, formalization of an area in logic where you, the ideas and concepts and relationships are, are explained and defined. So in Adam's actual ex investigations, the, uh, what all it observed was uh, shining light through uh, yeast that are growing in sugar solutions. But it was reasoning about proteins and genes and things like that, which they didn't actually physically observe. So to make it uh, clear what was happening, we formalized the whole steps all the way from the observations, uh, these millions of optical density measurements to the hypothesis, experimental goals, results, etc. So we tried to put it into this large uh, formal structure with 10,000 different actually objects in it. So here's a small part of that uh, formalization. Each of uh, these parts of this tree is a little hypothesis, which is related to other hypotheses. Uh, this is a traversal of this 10,000 node tree. Uh, the words underlined are part of ontology and formalized, and the relationship is a part of relationships. So replicate one is a part of experimental one, et cetera. So we tried to actually completely formalize the whole thing. Each of these uh, hypotheses was put into logic and represented. So data log and OWL are different logical languages uh, describing the hypotheses. Okay, so our second robot scientist was called Eve. It was applied to early stage drug design, especially to neglected tropical diseases. Uh, these diseases uh, uh, kill the best part of a million people a year still and infect hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and they are, I think, outrageously. So these diseases are neglected by the pharmaceutical industry because of cost. The people that get them are mostly poor people in the developing world who the pharmaceutical industry believe are not rich enough to afford to be treated. Uh, so neglected, and but it's actually uh, one thing they neglect. One thing they miss out the pharmaceutical industry is actually it's quite clear how to treat these diseases, and how to cure them. Unlike say type two diabetes, where we're, it's a very unclear how you can a single drug can intervene, or Alzheimer's, where uh, we don't really understand what's going on. Here it's very clear: just kill the parasite. So we uh, formalize the problem. We use graphs and standard key informatic methods to represent background knowledge. We used induction. Uh, so induction is a slight machine, standard machine learning to learn what are called quantitative structure activity relationships. These are little mathematical models where if you input a chemical structure, it outputs a predicted activity of that uh, molecule. And again, we used active learning to decide on efficient experiments. Uh, yeah, so Eve integrated the three basic steps of early stage drug design, library screening, hit confirmation. And the traditional approach in the pharmaceutical industry was you'd have a large library, maybe half a million compounds, a million compounds, and you'd test it against your little assay, your little test to tell you whether the compounds likely to be good or not. 
what Eve did is that it used active learning so that after it found a few hits, it would then selectively go through its library and only choose compounds to test which it thought were likely to be good. And we've demonstrated that this is a much more efficient way of uh, searching through a library. Uh, Eve is quite big. It was uh, about four meters by four meters by two meters. Uh, it's a relatively standard piece of laboratory automation, perhaps more integrated than normal in the industry. I'll just show a quick video of Eve working. It's I've moved it uh, to Sweden now in Chalmers. It was previously in Manchester. And what it's doing here is selecting compounds uh, to test its little machine learning model. It uses a, a standard in, uh, in biotechnology of micro titer plates. It's, it's like a little uh, plastic vessel with 384 little, uh, little vessel, well, tiny little dips in it, which you can use to do experiments. So I'm a bit short of time, so I'll press on. Yes, to demonstrate that this is an efficient way to, to do science compared to the traditional approach of the industry, we built an econometric model of the different costs involved in, uh, in drug design, you know, how much it costs to uh, screen a compound, how much your time costs, how much it costs to miss something. And we demonstrated that for most uh, parts of the cost base that it's rational to use machine learning uh, to choose examples. Only if you're, it costs a lot of money to actually miss one of the actual uh, key compounds or hit, then it, uh, it's rational to, to screen everything. Uh, the most interesting thing we found was this compound called triclosan. It's, uh, it's active against the, the parasite that causes malaria, and it's relatively safe because I've swallowed a lot of it in, uh, in Colgate toothpaste. You know, it used to be a standard ingredient. I want to say a bit about Genesis. This is uh, my new robot in, I'm building in Sweden. Uh, and it's designed to work and try to understand systems biology. In, uh, and biological systems are incredibly complicated. You know, there are thousands of genes, proteins, small molecules, all interacting in complicated temporal spatial ways. And because these systems evolved literally over billions of years, Occam's razor doesn't work very well. You know, they, they do things which no human designer would ever dream of doing the way they work. So I'd argue there's not enough PhDs in the world to disentangle these systems uh, anytime soon. And on top of that, the models are such, they're so complicated, they have thousands of components, they're beyond human intuitive understanding. So I'd argue we need robot scientist help. And so Genesis itself is, uh, I would argue a new form of scientific instrument, instrumentation. Most new instruments are, you know, you, you build a bigger telescope or a bigger synchrotron. And so the idea of Genesis is to take some uh, existing piece of equipment and just scale it up and industrialize it, make thousands of them. So Genesis will have uh, ability to do uh, 10,000 closed loop cycles of experiment in parallel. Uh, so it will have 10,000 little chemostats, which is a standard, um, well, it's a standard uh, microbioreactor, which is used in microbiology labs. Most labs would have maybe 10. So this is a thousand fold scale up on what's normal in them. And uh, it's probably more chemostats than the rest of the world put together. And only an AI system would be able to design, plan, execute these thousands of experiments in parallel. So let's show you some pictures. Just to finish up, uh, I think there is this nice analogy between games and signs. So in chess and go, there's this continuum of ability from the, the ability of novices up to grandmasters. And over time, computers followed that path, you know, from the very simple program Turing wrote up to, you know, my mobile phone can easily be the world champion at chess now. And if you believe, uh, there's a, con if you argue that, so I argue this is also true in science, that there's a continuum of ability from the very simple forms of science that Adam and Eve can do 
through what you and I can do up to the grand masters of science, you know, and Newton or Einstein. And if you accept this analogy, then it's likely that advances in computer hardware and software will drive the development of ever smarter robot scientists. And 10 years ago, the uh, physics Nobel Prize winner, Frank Wilczewicz, said that in 100 years time, the best physicist will be a machine. I'm involved in this uh, Nobel Turing Challenge. Uh, so the idea of the Nobel Turing Challenge is to build a computer robotic system capable of doing Nobel Prize winning uh, research by the year 2050. Uh, we had our kickoff meeting in London just before the pandemic hit. Uh, yes, we shall see. Uh, that's, that's ahead of Frank Wolchevich's schedule. So uh, my vision is this, uh, the collaboration between human and robot scientists will produce better science than either can alone. Uh, at least until very recently, human computer teams were still better at chess than uh, computers alone. You know, there were certain positions that computers didn't really fully understand. So I, I think it's, all, it's almost unarguable now that humans plus computers are better at science now. I think scientific knowledge should primarily be expressed in logic and associated probabilities and published using the semantic web. And this will produce better uh, productivity of science and lead to societal benefits, better food security, better medicines, etc. I'd like to thank uh, the many people that have, have worked on this uh, over the years. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the talk. I think we have now a bit of time for questions.